We love what we do. We love going to work. We love doing the show and making it the best that it can be. Well, Friends is such a successful show. It's always a top ten show. <laughs> it's truly like brothers and sisters, and uh, there's a deep love there. I love these people. They're all so fun to be around, and I care about them all. This is such an appealing premise uh, that we all want to be in there. If we could crawl into our TV sets and join them, we all would. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Back in 1994, when Monica said, there's nothing to tell, and spoke the first ever line of dialogue on Friends, few people watching would have thought they were seeing the first episode of what would become one of the world's hottest shows. Five series and over a hundred programs further on, advertisers in the USA pay over half a million dollars for an advertising slot in the show. And the list of guest stars that have visited Central Perk looks like a Hollywood Hall of Fame. Although none of the Friends stars had had major roles in successful long-running TV series previously, the casting directors did a fantastic job of putting together the tightest ensemble on TV today. However, Courtney Cox originally auditioned for the part of Rachel, and Kudrow was only available after losing a role on Frasier, for which she'd already been cast. When I met these actors, it was just, you know, just, you just thought, this is, this is a good thing. This is a good one. These act, this, this combination of people, this, this uh, you know, mix works really, really well, and I think, uh, I think people will like it. The six are not just a tight ensemble on screen. When they're not working, they're still good friends. We just kind of got lucky about that. And it didn't, it, it started off, it was, of course we're gonna get along. We've all got this great job. We've all come from television shows that didn't really work. And now all of a sudden we're all happy and it's working, so of course we're gonna get along. And then uh, we, just, we just really got lucky. There isn't a bad seed in the group. And uh, I can't believe I just said bad seed. <laughs> I can't believe it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> we, all, uh, we all are just getting along really, really well. <laughs> I enjoy Jennifer like, uh, like no other, like, not unlike a fine wine or a Chablis. We communicate well, we have a great time during rehearsal, and it's just the entire combination makes it, uh, makes it gel. I'm probably the luckiest person in the world when it comes to being able to work on a show we've been doing for four years, and we get along beautifully. I mean, it's unbelievable. I really like the show. I have a lot of respect for uh, the writing, and I, I think we do a good job. So um, anytime, you know, one of us starts to complain, including myself, about, oh, this is a lot of work. This Why are we staying so late? This should be getting easier. We remind each other that we work hard because of the quality of the show demands it. In fact, the cast have produced such a consistently good show that large pay bonuses and a party were in order when the Friends reached the landmark 100th show. And actually, we were kind of blasé about it throughout the week. If you remember, we were like, yeah, 100, yeah, that's great. No and big then, deal. And it didn't even no. hit us until I think we came out and saw a banner and the, it was just a, a big cake. Big cake. And, thing, and we were like, oh, yeah, felt wow. like a normal night. It's gone by really fast. I know. That's what's so crazy. We've all been on other shows where there's been tension and just weirdness. And I've never actually been on another show that went any farther than 13 episodes, <laughs> so I don't really... Well, still, me either. That feels like. Me either, but I'm saying, you know. Yeah. No, you have. You had that thing run on Blossom. I think one or two guest spots on Blossom. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. And um, I think it's the only thing I've ever done in my life a hundred times. Oh, we've done it a hundred times. Oh. Yeah. So you're just going to say that right out there, huh? It's awkward. All right. Uh, the show's about uh, six uh, individuals who uh, live in the Big Apple, and uh, each of them has separate careers and uh, love interests, and um, are, are in that phase of their lives where they're, they're not relying on their parents anymore for financial uh, stability and, and are not yet settled with uh, a husband or wife, or, 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 or I was, but, um, or, or kids. Um, and so we're in that kind of gray area where we're relying on our friends for uh, kind of emotional support and spiritual support and trying to make it on our own in the, in the big city. Friends gives us a situation that we all want to be in. We all want to have we all want to be single and carefree and young and attractive and have friends who care about us no matter what happens and be able to go on adventures and be able to have romances and come back and start all over again. And this is, I mean, this is the ideal and we can live that through friends.
Um, well, the good thing about Monica is sometimes she's obsessive, compulsive, like, you know, hard driving girl. But then, you know, next episode, she won't even care and she'll have her, I mean, she won't, she's not uptight all the time. I think she goes in spurts and I'm kind of actually like that too, you know. One of the hottest surprise developments in the fifth series of the show was the undercover relationship between Monica and Chandler. I hope that it keeps going because uh, for a couple of reasons. I'll get to kiss her a lot, which is nice. And also, it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic because I think it's the two most neurotic people on the show. It's really just brought this new life for me on the show. But um, just also showing another side to Monica that she's just like this. She just... I don't know, a sexual side is nice to show of Monica. Easy, She's so obsessed. I know. <laughs> Courtney Cox, a Southern girl, was born in Birmingham, Alabama on the 15th of June, 1964. And she spent her childhood growing up in its affluent suburbs. Yeah, my name is Alan Hunter, and uh, I was an original MTV VJ. That, that means I was like one of the first VJs on MTV. Courtney Cox uh, grew up around Mount Brook, which is the same area that I grew up in, in Birmingham. Uh, a, a nice, uh, uh, rich little place to, to grow up. They call it the Tiny Kingdom, though. The Tiny Kingdom is where Courtney grew up. They lived about two blocks away from my folks on a street called Knollwood in, uh, in the Tiny Kingdom of Mount Brook, Alabama, uh, an exclusive little area where, where if you, you got a weed in your yard, you're bad news. You're out of the neighborhood if you got a weed in your yard, if you know what I mean. So uh, that's where Courtney grew up. I think she'd like to hang around a, 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 a tinier part of the tiny kingdom, a place called Crestline, which is where all the cool yuppies hung out. And uh, I think Courtney used to butt around with some of her, uh, her buds in that little place. They'd, they'd go from a little coffee shop to a little gift shop, probably, to a little, another little coffee shop. Courtney went to Mount Brook High School, which is the, the high school in the Tiny Kingdom. It's a sprawling complex of uh, buildings and theaters and gymnasiums and soccer fields and football fields. A lot of money there at Mount Brook High School. Their books were not old and tattered. They were all new. I never called her this, but I know that her friends growing up in high school called her Cece, which uh, I think the reason I didn't call her Cece is because I understood that she would uh, she'd slug you if she called you that. I think you have to be a really co I think you have to be a girlfriend to call Courtney Cece. Um, and, and I was never her girlfriend, so I never called her Cece. While a teenager, Courtney's mother remarried into the local Copeland family, and she found herself related to Stuart Copeland, the drummer with the police, one of the world's hottest bands of the time. My name is Stuart Copeland, and I am uh, Courtney's first step cousin, or step first cousin. She is the daughter of my father's brother's new wife, as of about 25 years ago. Of course, you know you know the cousin thing uh, down south in Alabama. The joke is that you know you, you marry your cousin. Actually, she went out with my brother Ian for many years. Um, being cousins, we're from the south. You know, that's kind of way that, the way it works, I guess. But they were all sort of related from uh, New York to Alabama. Weird little connection there. Weirder than we should go into right now. But um, she's uh, one of the more bubblier and charismatic members of the family. I first met Courtney at a police show in Birmingham, Alabama, which is where my family comes from. And uh, down in Birmingham, Alabama, the Copeland family takes up half a telephone book. So there was Courtney in this sea of Copeland faces um, uh, as a new member, her mother having just married my uncle. And um, after escaping from this clan thing, you know, American and Southern American families can be very crushing in their hospitality. But she took me off into the night uh, of Birmingham, Alabama. And she, I think, was 17 or 18 at the time. With her, she had a flash sports car. And she showed me all over Birmingham, the, the, the night lights of Birmingham, Alabama. And, um, and then I didn't see her again for a few years until she moved up to New York and um, was represented by my brother Ian as a model. And she got a gig in a, in a uh, Bruce Springsteen video, and the rest is history. Let's see, early remembrances of Courtney Cox. I was working at MTV, it's about 1983, 84, something like that, and we all heard about this. Um, gal who got into a Bruce Springsteen video and uh, her she's from Birmingham and I thought wow that's pretty cool another Birminghamian on MTV imagine that how often would that happen and uh, lo and behold she was in it 
and uh, I thought it was pretty groovy. I then met her, uh, I think, shortly thereafter at a party at IRS Records, and uh, and we yapped about the hometown. She's challenging. That's what I like about her. That's what my brother loved about her. Was that she's challenging. She's very quick. She doesn't take any BS. She cuts straight to the thing, and she's very challenging. After graduating, Cox headed for the Big Apple, where she hooked up with her Copeland cousins, joined the Ford Model Agency, and landed a part in a music video for the classic Bruce Springsteen track, Dancing in the Dark. When she was in the Bruce Springsteen video, she was supposed to be a fan plucked from obscurity, which is really what she was at the time. She had had some work, um, I don't know if model is the right word, she was an actor in commercials, and I don't know if you call that a model, I'm not sure thespian I guess um, but that's so that was her first when a lot of people saw her and, and uh, she started to get a lot of calls for a lot of different things and she was in various things before friends came along um, but I guess that's where she really found her metier her modeling career continued to thrive and she was cast in her first movie role in the 1987 film masters of the universe and then as the girlfriend of michael j fox in his tv show family ties and courtney was getting fan mail back then um so a lot of times it's from girls but i get strange when i get ones from people that claim they're the devil i don't know i get like really weird fan mail but um i don't know usually it's from girls more and more movie appearances followed. Courtney made nine films between 87 and 94, including a starring role alongside Jim Carrey in Ace Ventura Pet Detective, as well as television appearances on Seinfeld, The Larry Sanders Show, and Murder, She Wrote. I really don't know what her career wishes were when she was young, when I first met her in Birmingham, Alabama, but I could see that she had something that which I've actually become familiar with, which is that golden ray of sun coming down from the heavens, lighting her up. In this sea of faces down there in Bummenheim, she stood out with her charisma and her sparkle and very quick wit. This was a live wire. You could see it back then. She had a particular sparkle. I can tell you that uh, Courtney is very puritanical. My wild and woolly brother Ian had all kinds of bad habits, drinking, partying, and late nights and all this stuff, and she slowed him right down. She just stopped that right there, and uh, he, uh, he absolutely had to clean up his act uh, with her. She didn't put up with any um, social deviance, you know, and she's actually just a good, clean girl from Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you very much. Come back and see us, y'all. I believe that Courtney's personal character is uh, not dissimilar to her character on, on Friends. She's a, she was a pretty no-nonsense gal, uh, from what I can tell in person. She's uh, kind of straight ahead, sarcastic. I'd like to be Monica on a, you know, on Prozac or something, <laughs> just a little more calm. Joey, the unemployed actor and fully employed babe magnet, has managed to take dumbness to a new level in Friends. But it's his relationship with the show's resident smartass that brings out some of the show's best moments. Kind of a neat little thing going, Maddie and I, Joey and Chandler. And it's uh, the cheap way to is like the odd couple thing, a roommate, whatever. But it, whatever it is, it's working, and we really look forward to having scenes together. It's hard, you know, you rehearse it all week, you put it up on its feet, and... You just can't get through it without cracking up. Matt LeBlanc was born in the East Coast city of Boston, home to Harvard College and the bar, which was the original inspiration for the huge 80s sitcom, Cheers. Everyone knows my name now, and I'm from, that I'm from Boston. Matthew grew up here with his mother. As an eight-year-old, he dreamed of becoming a motorcycle racer and was quite successful as a junior, but gave it up. He attended the local Newton North High School. I knew Matt LeBlanc when he was a student of mine. I would see him walking around on Main Street in school, and I would say, Matt, how are the studies going? He'd say, ah, oh, not so well, Mr. Leofanti. I'd say, Matt, you know, you're going to have to study and bear down if you're going to make a success of yourself. He'd just shake his head and say, no, that's, that's not for me. See, that's how smart I am. He made it without it. All right, Matt LeBlanc, he started off the 
school year of doing all his homework. And then he started dreaming, ninth grade. It's probably when he started to notice girls. Yeah, the closer we got to spring, <laughs> the less he did his homework. He uh, probably could have done a lot better if he really applied himself. Matt um, majored in carpentry here at Newton North. Um, in fact, his favorite teacher is probably his carpentry teacher, Mr. Barbosa. And uh, Matt was, from what I understand, a good carpenter, and he, he did put a lot of energy into that. Newton, for the most part, is a fairly upscale community, and most students go on to college. Um, Matt came from the area called the lake. There used to be a lake there, but they've since filled it in. Mostly Italian, Irish kids come from that area. And um, there's a real strong bond amongst those kids, and they're very proud to come from this area. And they're not known as the best students in the school, but they're known as the students that seem to have the most fun and enjoy the school the most and do a lot of, and, and contribute a lot to the school. Looking for the handsome Matt LeBlanc here. There he is. Matt LeBlanc remembers the good times. Billy, Bruno, Bresno, Ken, Kathy, Paul, Brian, Pete, Jimmy, Bobby, Dell, Big Dave, Joe, Daly, Bloomies, Weston, Forever Jenny. Thanks for everything, Mom, Dad, and Steve. He probably could have been a better student than he was. But he had dreams. After high school, he headed for New York, and soon after, a friend introduced him to his drama tutor, Flo Greenberg, who ran improv and drama classes for aspiring young actors. Get immediately to the conflict, bing, bing, right? And move it along. Oh, I first met Matt when he was barely 18. He had just come to New York. I don't think he had any intention of acting at that point. He was really a carpenter. And one of my students brought him to my adult class. And he walked in, and it was love at first sight. It's impossible when you meet Matt not to fall in love with him. It makes it all rather worse. We're changing to much worse. And after the class, I remember his coming over and saying, I think I like to do this. This is, this is fun. Um, you have room? somebody else in the class and I said I certainly do for you young man <laughs> you, my daddy and I say daddy I'm pregnant <laughs> he is totally engaging he's completely unpretentious he never ever had any idea of the impact that he had on the opposite sex he was so handsome and so charming and so completely without guile, very, very dear, very talented, enormously talented. His life as a carpenter turned into a career as a successful model, then award-winning commercials actor for Levi's 501s and Heinz Ketchup. I sent him along to um, agents, yes, indeed. I wanted as many people as I could to find to see him. And they all loved him. The first jobs that he got were all commercials. And he did very, very well in commercials. In fact, he had one commercial that was a Heinz ketchup commercial that was very, it became very famous, it became international, and then it was used later in another movie. And um, I remember Matt telling me that with that one commercial, he was able to buy a house in California and a car and a motorcycle and a wardrobe of clothes, which <laughs> that was great. Matt um, went to California. When he left, he said to me, Flo, I'm not quite ready to go. I know that we need a, to work a little bit more. But it was impossible to keep him away. I mean, it, it, everybody wanted him. He was doing one commercial after another. 
everybody was clamoring for him, and rightfully so, and people wanted him for sitcoms. And he did quite a few sitcoms before he got to Friends. But he was sent for, and he had to go. And every now and again, he would call me and say, Flo, I should just come and work with you for two weeks straight, and we'll just finish up. I said, I'd love it whenever you have time. But from that day to this, he's never had time. The success of the series has meant that the cast have become some of the world's most famous faces, recognized wherever they go. After the first series, Matt would be mopped by fans shouting, Hey Joey, whenever he went out. Yeah, well that's what it used to be now. It's four people come up and say, Hey Matt. So that's it's like entered that area now where it's everyone knows my name now and I'm from that I'm from Boston and all these kinds of things. That's a little unnerving at times, but you know, it's great. Fame does have a downside. Sometimes it's difficult to deal with those people who are your biggest fans. I can't deny that it bothers me uh, at, at times that we're in the tabloids or that uh, we try to go out to dinner and there are people in, you know, chasing us in cars with video cameras. If I'm having a nice dinner with someone, I'm having a conversation. If someone comes up and says, hey, can I get a picture? I say, you know what, not right now. It's inappropriate. I'm having a nice dinner right now. We're in a restaurant. But if, uh, you know, if I'm getting a hot dog at a stand, uh, you know, that's another thing if I'm on the street. But I think people... Um, have to learn to, to recognize when it's appropriate and when it's not. If being a star doesn't bring enough pressure, being the cover girl for People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People issue definitely delivered Courtney a whole new set of problems. After that cover came out, I thought, oh gosh, I really now I'm gonna have to try to look good all the time. And that's not good. I felt, I felt a little pressure because I just knew people would say, oh my God, that's what she really looks like. Because, you know, you, you take a picture of somebody and you blow, you know, you sandblast the shot and everything becomes white and you see no freckles and it becomes, you know, it's, it's, it's not really what you look like. All of the Friends cast have their own fans who are just crazy about them. But Jennifer Aniston is the only one to have a fan base just for her hair. It's flattering, but you know what? You start to, there's definitely a part of you that says, hmm, why am I getting noticed for my haircut and not for my work? The ironic thing, however, is that the famous haircut was not Jennifer's favorite. I walked out of that hair salon practically in tears thinking, oh, I don't know what the hell he did in my hair. I'm wearing a hat for a year. And that's the ironic part, is then all of a sudden everybody starts talking about it. Jennifer's haircut seemed to lead a celebrity life of its own, but now she feels enough is enough. That haircut hasn't been around for four years. Let it die. <laughs> Jennifer Aniston, or Jennifer Anistonopoulos as she was then, was born in Sherman Oaks on February 11, 1969, but grew up in this Manhattan apartment block as a member of a showbiz family. Her father, John Aniston, was a soap actor and regular on Days of Our Lives. And her godfather was TV and movie actor Telly Savalas. While attending the Rudolf Steiner School, she began to act in the school drama club. She was also a talented artist, and at 11 had a painting exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. But it was acting that was the bigger attraction, and she applied to join the drama class at LaGuardia School of Performing Arts, the school which was the inspiration for the hip movie and TV series, Fame. We used to audition uh, about 4,000 kids a year and had openings for about 85 to 90. So to get in, you had to be good. Didn't have to be professional, but had to show the instinct. Jennifer had that capacity to show a greater capacity to show emotions, love, hate, joy, sorrow. It, you could see it in her eyes. So she was an interesting kid, one of the good ones. Most young people come to secondary education tabula rasa, a clean slate, and they let the faculty write on that slate. 
Then there are kids like Jennifer who appear not tabula rasa, but they seem to already be what they're going to be. They're like a piece of undeveloped film waiting for the developer to bring to the surface that embedded image that's already been planted there. Hi, I went to Music and Art. My name is Andrew Kane. I graduated with Jennifer Aniston. 1987 was one of the most talented school, you know, years. There's the yearbook picture of Jennifer Aniston in here, if, if you'd like to see. So here she is. Her yearbook picture is on, is, is on you know, on this page with, you know, Cher's daughter, Chastity, and, you know, Eagle Eye Cherry, who's out and doing a lot of music. Jennifer Aniston's uh, quote says, it's been a real experience. My friends in PA will live in my heart forever. I'll miss you, which is really nice. Not surprisingly, students at the School of Performing Arts used any opportunity to dress up and perform on stage or off. Every uh, Halloween, every year during Halloween, um, people dress up. And it's, a, it's like a big time of the year in La Guardia, you know. Some people don't, some people do. It's a lot of fun. People who dress up for Halloween, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I was photographing a lot in high school. Um, and I happen to have one photograph of Jennifer Aniston. Here it is. Yep, this is her. Um, she's a witch. Jennifer at school, I remember, at the old school, the new school, exuberant. Lots of energy. I remember uh, one of our spring drama festivals I was directing, and she was on the stage crew. And when the show was over, the last performance, I remember all the girls and boys, they were jumping around. They were so happy the show was over. She had so much energy. She was 15, I think. So much energy and funny and leading everybody and singing and dancing. <laughs> One of the things I remember most about Jennifer was her working on stage crew, hauling scenery, painting scenery, setting lights, working on makeup, sewing costumes. She always made herself available. And working on her scenes, rehearsing after school for hours. But basically, I think of Jennifer as a member of the team. And I watch in Friends, she seems to have taken that into her career. But she was a great kid when it came to cooperating. And we'd have to send her home because she'd stay forever. Actually, when I was a senior in high school, I worked in an advertising agency for about a year. I was a receptionist. As well as office and messenger work, young Jennifer also worked as a waitress at Jackson's Hole, which is maybe why she looks so convincing waiting tables at the Friends Coffee Shop, Central Perk. With Jennifer, it always seemed that whatever job she was doing, she was already marked out for stardom. She was one of those people who are just born to be on camera. Some people uh, just have a bone structure or, or a personality that when you put them on camera, uh, the camera loves them. They don't have to say a word. They just love them. She got on camera. You don't look at anybody else. And she was funny. Had a wonderful sense of comedy. Could find the timing. You know, comedy is someone said, who was it? I forget who said it, but uh, comedy is like music. You have to know the notes and the timing, the rhythm and the timing. When she got on camera, she brought something else to it. There was some extra thing to it. It was, was behind the eyes. That's it. You can look at somebody on camera, on television, on movies, and the really good ones, not doesn't mean the stars, but I mean the good actors. There's something behind the eyes. You can see something. You can see the brain working. And she had it, had it as a young girl. She was wonderful in that camera. She got an A, I'm sure. Any actor in the U.S. who wants to make it in TV or the movies has to head for Los Angeles, and Jennifer was no exception. Although she was pretty successful landing parts in Quantum Leap, Burke's Law, and the TV version of Ferris Bueller, somehow a long-running role in a long-running series eluded her. They've all gotten on the air except for one, pilot, but they'll last maybe six episodes, 13 episodes. I think the most I did was 19 episodes of a show. And then they never... They're never heard of. Nobody knows about them. 
But since Jennifer became Rachel, millions of men have developed a thing about her, which is love to be Ross. Yeah, so I can completely understand why half of America has a crush on her. Not when you're making that scrunchy face, though. I think maybe why do they like Rachel? She's, she's sort of innocent and vulnerable and, you know, genuine. And uh, that's, those are attractive traits, I guess. A well, question that arises frequently is there a difference between Jennifer and Rachel? How much of Rachel is Jennifer and how much of Jennifer is Rachel? But that's a, a question that every actor faces. The good ones force you to ask that question. I'm distracted. I'm not distracted. I just think, I go into my head. People make fun of me because like Matt always makes fun of me because I go off and I'll go into the zone. What's going on with the romance thing is the central preoccupation with many friends watchers. If they're not thinking about what's happening with Ross and Rachel, or Chandler and Janice, they're wondering what it would be like if, uh, say, Perry and Cox got together. It's, it's certainly a bad thing, a bad idea in general to get into a relationship with somebody you're working with because you're going to break up and then it's going to be bad and you have to see the person every day. But, you know, I don't want to say that and then, you know, cut to four years from now I'm married to Courtney Cox. <laughs> and then they'll play that at the wedding. Then if you're not gonna date someone you work with, the world is gonna take time to check out just who you're seeing. And then there's Matthew Perry and Julia Roberts. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm dating a, a woman named uh, Julia Roberts, who, uh, I've got to clear this up, though. It's not the Julia Roberts from the movies. It's, uh, she's a cobbler, <laughs> but a good cobbler. Sadly, the romance with Julia Roberts didn't last, and Matthew is still searching. But this time, he knows what he's looking for. I'm looking for rich, very, very wealthy. I'm looking for uh, somebody who can play hockey better than I can. And uh, so I don't know why I haven't been able to find this. A rich <laughs> hockey player woman? Why should I be having a problem? Matthew Perry grew up in an upmarket part of Ottawa in Canada. Although he was born in Williamston, Massachusetts, on the 19th of August, 1969, he moved to Canada after his model mother and Old Spice actor father split up. He grew up in this Ashbury house with his mother and news anchor stepfather and attended the exclusive Ashbury College. Matthew Perry was here for grade 8 at Ashbury College and that he was quite the hockey player, soccer player. Well, he was more of the goalie for soccer. And he has been back to the school occasionally to see Greg Simpson, who uh, was the director of The Lord of the Flies. Uh, he directed it and uh, Matthew was, was uh, very talented in the production when he was in grade 8. He came back a few years ago and he had to sort of run off because the kids, um, yeah, because <laughs> he's here, he's here, go, go, go. But he came back a, a few years ago and uh, I was lucky enough that he sat in some of my drama classes and talked about professional script writing and, and acting. And uh, this was before Friends. And uh, he talked a lot about Hollywood and a lot about uh, what he was doing, which was fascinating to, to my, my students who had known his work on various sitcoms that he was involved in. And uh, he signed autographs all the time he signed, he signed autographs. Even as early as grade 8, Matthew showed a real determination to get to the top as an actor. Back in 1981, and we were going to do a show called uh, The Death and Life of Sneaky Fitch, and he came out and he had his part all memorized, I mean the audition piece. Uh, none of the other kids had memorized anything, and right away I thought that that was really incredible. Went through the audition process and we cast him. It was just the beginning of a, of a great uh, three-play career here at the school forum. He was a terrific kid and a great success in that role. 
P1 awards for getting over 80%. Uh, he was also very involved with public speaking. Here's a, an article on Matthew when he was um, involved with a public speaking group. It says that um, the audience was in turn amused by Willie Rabbies and My Father and Me, informed by Matthew Perry's Pay TV. So I, I guess he, he did a special public speaking um, topic of Pay TV. He was a cast leader. He was helpful. He was always there at the beginning, uh, first, always almost the last to leave. I know that sounds like a, a hockey player, but it's true. Um, and, you know, he, they had cast parties. He was always involved and friendly and up and positive, even in the sort of the dark days of, of sort of late November when we were rehearsing and into the sort of wee hours. Uh, he was always good with the other kids. And a lot of the cast members uh, thought he was just terrific, no question about that. I know that at one point I believe that he was thinking about doing something in tennis. He was a good, good tennis player, and I think at one point in his, like when he was in grade seven and eight, I think he was thinking about perhaps he might want to take that on as a profession. At 15, he moved to California to join his father and to progress his tennis career. But he soon found out that he was a good player, but not a potential champion, and he turned to acting. <laughs> Two out of, his, out of the three shows that he did here were comedies, and he was terrific. His timing and his facial expressions and his, his what we call psychophysical action, the way he was able to move his body uh, in, 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 in those two shows, were, it was outstanding. And it was brilliant. And much of his work in dramatic arts, too, at that time, was improvi improvisational comedy. So no, it doesn't surprise me at all that he's moved into, into the field of comedy at this point. Although his obvious talents as a comedy actor meant that he was frequently cast in TV series, they never succeeded long term. I was on every cancelled show that George Clooney wasn't on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was on a show called Boys Will Be Boys for a while and another show. <laughs> but the thing is that he persevered. And I remember speaking to him in person when he was, you know, on contract to write and he couldn't audition for a particular film and he was not upset but you could see that you know there was an opportunity that he couldn't that he couldn't uh, fulfill at that time and, and yet he kept on and on and on and that's the determination the hard work and then friends came and that's the thing and that just did not surprise me because there isn't such a thing as far as I'm concerned as an overnight success I mean he put in his hard work and his dues but he kept at it you know during the low times and, and obviously the high times I love Chandler lines to me my opinion, oh, maybe I shouldn't say this, but Chandler Lines can make a show for me. When I watch the show, it's, if something's happening and it's... I know, I know. If I could play any other character on the show, I would play... Chandler. I would say that uh, Chandler is the funniest. I can relate to this guy because I have kind of the same sense of humor as he does, and I guess that uh, involves a certain amount of acerbic... Quality, but I, I have to admit that before I got the show and was described that way, I didn't know what acerbic meant. You said that. You just said that? I did. I said, I'll freely admit it to America. I didn't quite know what it meant. Because there's a weird SC spelling thing going on in that word, and I could never handle it or grasp it. Despite Matthew's comprehension problems, his friend's character, Chandler, is someone we can all identify with. He's, uh, you, people can relate to him because... Uh, he kind of wears his heart on his sleeve. Perry's script writing background has meant that he sometimes comes up with his own Chandler jokes. Basically, I, I pitch, I'm like Oral Hershiser, man, with, the, with funny lines, and about, you know, two out of ten maybe make the show, and like five out of ten or nobody even understands. Friends has managed to collect a list of guest star appearances that many Hollywood big-budget movies would find it hard to rival. There have been regulars like Tom Selleck and one-offs like Julia Roberts and Robin Williams, but the biggest guest star on the series was probably London. While Joey, Monica, Chandler and Rachel were in London to see Ross and Emily get married, they ran into Virgin boss Richard Branson and Fergie. I thought she was great. Uh, I'd work with her again. Well, the paparazzi really showed up when she showed up, too. We thought we were a very big deal until Fergie showed up, and then we realized that. No. Yeah, they must have known she was coming. Yeah, much, <laughs> much bigger deal when she was there. The show had the freedom to shoot anywhere and everywhere except Buckingham Palace. 
Yeah, she said, no. Yeah, the queen just went, hey, you know what? All the shooting? No. You're not shooting anything. And we said, hey, we'll put you on the show. And she went, oh, no. And Fergie is apparently keen to make a return appearance. She's been begging. She's been writing letters upon letters upon letters, but uh, it's pretty much up to Maddie, because Maddie was in the scene. Because real life sometimes intervenes, even in the lives of TV stars, Lisa couldn't make it to London with the others. I didn't go. You didn't go? I was too pregnant. Oh, no. Couldn't go. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll there. figure out Did you get a good shot? But they made sure they kept in touch. We've been faxing, keeping each other informed. Not she and I, at least she and I to Lisa. <laughs> Just to clarify. It was weird coming here without her, definitely. But yeah. uh, the next time we see her, she'll, she'll have a baby, so mm -hmm. it'll be fun. Everyone but me is exactly like their character. <laughs> Phoebe listens really carefully, I think, to what everybody's saying. It's just, you know, her response <laughs> doesn't go through like the circuits it would for other people. You know, comes out something different. Phoebe may be coming at things from a different angle, but Lisa is very protective about her and certainly doesn't want anyone calling her dumb. You know what the thing is? I've, I've thought about it. I think my problem is it's like someone in your family. I'm allowed to complain about her, but you're not. <laughs> so, okay. so it's sure. as if, like, I'm allowed to say she's dumb, but you can't. She projects something of herself and she manages to convey a kind of naivete and an innocence that doesn't look phony, although we know that she is, in reality, much more hep than her character is. Lisa Kudrin <laughs> is uh, one of the few people on the face of the planet that uh, I have no idea what's going to come out of her mouth from one minute to the next. Yeah. I defy you to find someone who will be able to say a line like Lisa Kudrow. She's completely unique. Why can't she just have her own adjective? Well, in some ways, Lisa Kudrow's character, Phoebe, is the most stand out character of the whole bunch in that she's a very she's the most eccentric character on the show and the most noticeable and she's called on to do really some some weird types of things make up some songs play like she's so far out of it she doesn't really understand what's going on so there are some acting challenges that she has in that show that are peculiar to her character so maybe it's not so surprising that if someone had to win the award it would be her Lisa has in fact won awards and received two Emmy nominations, as well as Golden Globe, Screen Actors Guild, and American Comedy Award nominations. Tarzana, the valley town in California, was named after the fictional jungle hero Tarzan, because it's where his creator, Edgar Rice Burroughs, made his home. It's also the hometown of Lisa Kudrow. Lisa, who was born on the 30th of July, 1963, has a medical family. Both her father and her brother are doctors specializing in headache treatment. After a difficult time at junior high, Lisa went to Taft School and fixed her sights on getting good grades. My junior high school experience was pretty brutal, but high school by then, I had so many walls built up that I couldn't be hurt anymore. And um, <laughs> no, I just wouldn't have it. I just wasn't going to be hurt. And I actually felt like I outgrew them. You know, the cheerleaders and the jocks and everything. And I was really just happy to focus on studying and getting good grades and going to an Eastern college. That was my big goal. After graduating, she went to the Select Vassar College in upstate New York, where, as well as playing tennis, she graduated with a biology major and returned to California intending to work with her father and pursue a career in medical research. But things changed after a meeting with one of her brother's friends, the actor and comic John Lovitz, who encouraged her to take up performing. After an initial rejection, she joined the famed comedy improv group, The Groundlings, in 1989, and now she teaches there occasionally. Her TV and movie career was a success even before Friends. She has appeared in 17 movies, played Woody's girlfriend in Cheers, and Phoebe's evil twin sister, Ursula, in the sitcom Mad About You. Ursula has also appeared in Friends, with Lisa playing the roles with her real-life sister helping out. We got my sister to be the other side of me, the back of my head, we look exactly alike. My sister, my real sister in real so life. So your real sister is Ursula. She's Ursula or Phoebe, like it's me. You, you only see me.
David Schwimmer, as an L.A. boy, has always been surrounded by the TV and movie business. He was born on November 2, 1966, and his parents are both high-power L.A. lawyers. His mother handled Roseanne Barr's divorce. David went to Beverly Hills High, the school which is the basis for 90210. And it was here that he first tried out acting in his school drama class. Hooked on acting, he attended a summer acting program at Northwestern University, Chicago, and on graduating from high school, enrolled at Northwestern as a speech and theater major. In 1988, David founded the Looking Glass Theater Company with some of his friends and went on to win six Joseph Jefferson Awards for The Jungle, his debut effort at theater directing. After Northwestern, David returned to L.A. and parts in L.A. Law, Blossom, The Wonder Years, and NYPD Blue, where he played a nerd who shoots a mugger. Despite his love of acting, he believes that in his real life off-camera, he's just a shy guy. I'm actually, I am intensely shy. Like, I'm not the guy at the party who's like the life of the party. At the party, I'm like on a couch in the corner talking, you know, maybe talking to someone. I, I, you know, don't, you know, you have to feel sorry for me. That's just who I am. But for him, becoming the sensitive Ross and Friends has meant not just fame and fortune, but having to cope with the surprise of becoming a sex symbol. Ma, ma. Hey. Ma. Ma. This is very strange to me that you even hear that. Um, yeah. No, of course I had no. Uh, I'm in. Yeah, <clears throat> it's embarrassing to even think of myself as a as a sex symbol hunk. Is it really David or Ross that people are falling for? People are kind of falling for like the character and not necessarily me. I'm I'm not as vulnerable in real life. Uh, I'm probably a little more aggressive uh, when it comes to pursuing uh, someone I'm interested in. So, probably I'm less attractive in real life. So, what is it about Ross that people really seem to like? He's a regular Joe. He wants the good life. He wants to be married. He wants to have kids. He struck me as a family guy, and he struck me as a guy who is romantic and who uh, wants to be in love. And um, I just thought, oh, this is a guy I can play. Though all the cast members get on really well together, there have been some regulars that haven't been as popular, like Marcel. The difficulty with the monkey was that it was just, it made it, the process a lot slower. It was just a l much harder work and just not as fun or rewarding or challenging. Um, the fact is it's a monkey and it doesn't know how to act. There's no kind of give and take. All the, all the fun of the scenes were created in the editing room and um, you just had to pray and hope that the monkey would eventually hit its mark or eventually lift a banana or do whatever and that to me is not acting. But apart from the monkey, everything seemed to work out just fine for Joey, Ross, Chandler, Phoebe, Rachel and Monica and after five seasons the scripts are as strong and friends are just as tight as they ever were. I think if someone started to get an ego or started to something went wrong with them, I don't think the other people would let that happen. I mean, we would sit them down and say, you know, I'm, I'm saying we. <laughs> I'm definitely not a performer. Well, your talk is coming. <laughs> it's been quite a ride. We, but it's still, you know, as big as the show's gotten, it's still the six of us and the great communication we have with our writers and producers and this intimate show that we make. We adore each other. all the time. These are people I would choose as my friends in a minute, heartbeat. Lisa Kudrow and Courtney Cox are the best girlfriends you could ever ask for, and wonderful, and the boys are just the sweetest, most caring boys you could. We're the best boys. We love our boys. Fantastic. I'd like to be Monica on a, you know, on Prozac or something, <laughs> just a little more calm. <laughs> Joey, the unemployed actor and fully employed babe magnet, has managed to take dumbness to a new level in Friends. But it's his relationship with the show's resident smartass that brings out some of the show's best moments. Kind of a neat little 
thing going, Maddie and I, Joey and Chandler, and it's uh, the cheap way to is like the odd couple thing, a roommate, whatever. But it, whatever it is, it's working, and we really look forward to having scenes together. It's hard, you know. You rehearse it all week, you put it up on its feet, and you just can't get through it without cracking up. Matt LeBlanc was born in the East Coast city of Boston, home to Harvard College and the bar, which was the original inspiration for the huge '80s sitcom Cheers. Everyone knows my name now, and I'm from that I'm from Boston. Matthew grew up here with his mother. As an eight-year-old, he dreamed of becoming a motorcycle racer, and was quite successful as a junior, but gave it up. He attended the local Newton North High School. I knew Matt LeBlanc when he was a student of mine. I would see him walking around on Main Street in school, and I would say, Matt, how are the studies going? He'd say, ah, oh, not so well, Mr. Leofanti. I say, Matt, you know, you're going to have to study and bear down if you're going to make a success of yourself. He'd just shake his head and say, no, that's, that's not for me. See, that's how smart I am. He made it without it. All right, Matt LeBlanc, he started off the school year doing all his homework. And then he started dreaming, ninth grade. It's probably when he started to notice girls. Yeah, the closer we got to spring, <laughs> the less he did his homework. He uh, probably could have done a lot better if he really applied himself. Matt um, majored in carpentry here at Newton North. Um, in fact, his favorite teacher is probably his carpentry teacher, Mr. Barbosa. And uh, Matt was, from what I understand, a good carpenter, and he, he did put a lot of energy into that. Newton, for the most part, is a fairly upscale community, and most students go on to college. Um, Matt came from the area called the Lake. There used to be a lake there, but they've since filled it in. Mostly Italian, Irish kids come from that area, and um, there's a real strong bond amongst those kids, and they're very proud to come from this area. And they're not known as the best students in the school, but they're known as the students that seem to have the most fun and enjoy the school the most and do a lot of, and, and contribute a lot to the school. Looking for the handsome Matt LeBlanc here. There he is. Matt LeBlanc remembers the good times. Billy, Bruno, Bresno, Ken, Kathy, Paul, Brian, Pete, Jimmy, Bobby, Dell, Big Dave, Joe, Daly, Bloomies, Weston, Forever Jenny. Thanks for everything, Mom, Dad, and Steve. He probably could have been a better student than he was. But he had dreams. After high school, he headed for New York. And soon after, a friend introduced him to his drama tutor, Flo Greenberg, who ran improv and drama classes for aspiring young actors. Get immediately to the conflict, bing, bing, right? And move it along. Oh, I first met Matt when he was barely 18. He had just come to New York. I don't think he had any intention of acting at that point. He was really a carpenter. And one of my students brought him to my adult class. And he walked in. And it was love at first sight. It's impossible when you meet Matt not to fall in love with him. It makes it all rather worse. We're changing to much worse. And after the class, I remember his coming over and saying, I think I like to do this. This is this is fun. Um, you have room for somebody else in the class? And I said, I certainly do for you, young man. <laughs> you my daddy and I say, Daddy, I'm pregnant. <laughs> he is totally engaging. He's completely unpretentious. He never, ever had any idea of the impact that he had on the opposite sex. He was so handsome and so charming and so completely without guile. Very, very dear. Very talented. Enormously talented. His life as a carpenter turned into a career as a successful model, 
then award-winning commercials actor for Levi's 501s and Heinz Ketchup. I sent him along to um, agents, yes, indeed. I wanted as many people as I could to find to see him, and they all loved him. The first jobs that he got were all commercials, and he did very, very well in commercials. In fact, he had one commercial that was a Heinz ketchup commercial that was very, it became very famous, it became international, and then it was used later in another movie. And um, I remember Matt telling me that with that one commercial, he was able to buy a house in California and a car and a motorcycle and a wardrobe of clothes, which <laughs> that was great. Matt um, went to California. When he left, he said to me, Flo, I'm not quite ready to go. I know that we need a, to work a little bit more. But it was impossible to keep him away. I mean, it, it, everybody wanted him. He was doing one commercial after another. Everybody was clamoring for him, and rightfully so. And people wanted him for sitcoms. And he did quite a few sitcoms before he got to Friends. But he was sent for, and he had to go. And every now and again, he would call me and say, Flo, I should just come and work with you for two weeks straight, and we'll just finish up. I said, I'd love it whenever you have time. But from that day to this, he's never had time. The success of the series has meant that the cast have become some of the world's most famous faces, recognized wherever they go. After the first series, Matt would be mopped by fans shouting, Hey Joey, whenever he went out. Yeah, well that's what it used to be now. It's four people come up and say, Hey Matt. So that's, it's like entered that area now, where it's, everyone knows my name now, and I'm from, that I'm from Boston and all these kinds of things. That's a little unnerving at times, but you know, it's great. Fame does have a downside. Sometimes it's difficult to deal with those people who are your biggest fans. I can't deny that it bothers me uh, at, at times that we're in the tabloids or that uh, we try to go out to dinner and there are people in, you know, chasing us in cars with video cameras. If I'm having a nice dinner with someone, I'm having a conversation. If someone comes up and says, hey, can I get a picture? I say, you know what, not right now. It's inappropriate. I'm having a nice dinner right now. We're in a restaurant. But if, uh, you know, if I'm getting a hot dog at a stand, uh, you know, that's another thing if I'm on the street. But I think people um, have to learn to, to recognize when it's appropriate and when it's not. If being a star doesn't bring enough pressure, being the cover girl for People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People issue definitely delivered court. We love what we do. We love going to work. We love doing the show and making it the best that it can be. Well, Friends is such a successful show. It's always a top ten show. <laughs> it's truly like brothers and sisters, and uh, there's a deep love there. I love these people. They're all so fun to be around, and I care about them all. This is such an appealing premise uh, that we all want to be in there. If we could crawl into our TV sets and join them, we all would. Back in 1994, when Monica said, there's nothing to tell, and spoke the first ever line of dialogue on Friends, few people watching would have thought they were seeing the first episode of what would become one of the world's hottest shows. Five series and over a hundred programs further on, advertisers in the USA pay over half a million dollars for an advertising slot in the show. And the list of guest stars that have visited Central Perk looks like a Hollywood Hall of Fame. Although none of the Friends stars had had major roles in successful long-running TV series previously, the casting directors did a fantastic job of putting together the tightest ensemble on TV today. However, Courtney Cox originally auditioned for the part of Rachel, and Kudrow was only available after losing a role on Frasier, for which she'd already been cast. When I met these actors, it was just, you know, 
You just thought this is this is a good thing. This is a good one. These act this this combination of people, this this uh, you know mix works really really well, and I think uh, I think people will like it. The six are not just a tight ensemble on screen. When they're not working, they're still good friends. We just kind of got lucky about that, and it didn't. It, it started off. It was, of course, we're going to get along. We've all got this great job. We've all come from television shows that didn't really work, and now all of a sudden we're all happy and it's working. So of course we're going to get along. And then uh, we just we just really got lucky. There isn't a bad seed in the group, and uh, I can't believe I just said bad seed. <laughs> I can't believe it. And uh, you know, <laughs> we all. Uh, we all are just getting along really, really well. <laughs> I enjoy Jennifer like uh, like no other, like not unlike a fine wine or a Chablis. We communicate well. We have a great time during rehearsal, and it's just uh, the entire combination makes it uh, makes it gel. I'm probably the luckiest person in the world when it comes to being able to work on a show we've been doing for four years, and we get along. Beautifully. I mean, it's unbelievable. I really like the show. I have a lot of respect for uh, the writing, and I, I think we do a good job. So, um, anytime you know one of us starts to complain, and including myself, about oh, this is a lot of work. This why are we staying so late? This should be getting easier. We remind each other that we work hard because of the quality of the show demands it. In fact, the cast have produced such a consistently good show that large pay bonuses and a party were in order when the friends reached the landmark 100th show. And actually, we were kind of blasé about it throughout the week. If you remember, we were like, yeah, 100, yeah, that's great. No and big then, deal. And it didn't even uh, hit us until I think we came out and we saw a banner and the, it was just a big cake. Big and, cake. Thing, and we were like, oh, yeah, It felt wow. like a normal night. It went by really fast. I know. That's what's so crazy. We've all been on other shows where there's been tension and just weirdness. And I've never actually been on another show that went any farther than 13 episodes, <laughs> so I don't really... Well, still, me either. What that feels yeah. like. Me either, but I'm saying, you know. Yeah. No, you have. You had that thing run on Blossom. I think one or two guest spots on Blossom. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. And um, I think it's the only thing I've ever done in my life a hundred times. Oh, we've done it a hundred times. Oh, oh. Yeah. So you're just going to say that right out there, huh? It's awkward. All right. Uh, the show's about uh, six uh, individuals who uh, live in the Big Apple, and uh, each of them has separate careers and uh, love interests, and um, are, are in that phase of their lives where they're they're not relying on their parents anymore for financial uh, stability, and and are not yet settled with uh, a husband or wife, or or, or, or I was, but um, or, or kids, um, and so we're in that kind of gray area where we're relying on our friends for uh, kind of emotional support and spiritual support and trying to make it on our own in the, in the big city. Friends gives us a situation that we all want to be in. We all want to have, we all want to be single and carefree and young and attractive and have friends who care about us no matter what happens and be able to go on adventures and be able to have romances and come back and start all over again. And this is, I mean, this is the ideal and we can live that through friends. Um, well, the good thing about Monica is sometimes she's obsessive, compulsive, like, you know, hard driving girl but then you know next episode she won't even care and she'll have her i mean she won't she's not uptight all the time i think she goes in spurts and i'm kind of actually like that too you know one of the hottest surprise developments in the fifth series of the show was the undercover relationship between monica and chandler i hope that it keeps going because uh for a couple of reasons i'll get to kiss her a lot which is nice and also, it's, it's kind of an interesting dynamic, because I think it's the two most neurotic people on the show. It's really just brought this new life for me on the show. But um, just also showing another side to Monica, that she's just like this, she just, I don't know, a sexual side is nice to show of Monica. Easy, she's so obsessed. I know. <laughs> Courtney Cox, a Southern girl, was born in Birmingham, Alabama on the 15th of June, 1964. And she spent her childhood growing up in its suburbs. Yeah, my name is Alan Hunter, and uh, I was an original MTV VJ. That, that means I was like one of the first VJs on MTV. Courtney Cox uh, grew up around Mountain Brook, which is the same area that I grew up in, in Birmingham. Uh, a, a nice, uh, uh, rich little place to, to grow up. They call it the Tiny Kingdom, though. The Tiny Kingdom is where Courtney grew up. 
they lived about two blocks away from my folks on a street called Knollwood in, uh, in the tiny kingdom of Mount Brook, Alabama, uh, an exclusive little area where, where if you, you got a weed in your yard, you're bad news. You're out of the neighborhood if you got a weed in your yard, if you know what I mean. So uh, that's where Courtney grew up. I think she'd like to hang around a, 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 a tinier part of the tiny kingdom, a place called Crestline, which is where all the cool yuppies hung out. And uh, I think Courtney used to butt around with some of her, uh, her buds in that little place. They'd, they'd go from a little coffee shop to a little gift shop, probably, to a little, another little coffee shop. Courtney went to Mount Brook High School, which is the, the high school in the Tiny Kingdom. It's a sprawling complex of uh, buildings and theaters and gymnasiums and soccer fields and football fields. A lot of money there at Mount Brook High School. Their books were not old and tattered. They were all new. I never called her this, but I know that her friends growing up in high school called her Cece, which uh, I think the reason I didn't call her Cece is because I understood that she would uh, she'd slug you if she called you that. I think you have to be a really co I think you have to be a girlfriend to call Courtney CC. Um, and, and I was never her girlfriend, so I never called her CC. While a teenager, Courtney's mother remarried into the local Copeland family, and she found herself related to Stuart Copeland, the drummer with the police, one of the world's hottest bands of the time. My name is Stuart Copeland, and I am uh, Courtney's first step cousin, or step first cousin. She is the daughter of my father's brother's new wife, as of about 25 years ago. Of course, you know you know the cousin thing uh, down south in Alabama. The joke is that you know you, you marry your cousin. Actually, she went out with my brother Ian for many years. Um, being cousins, we're from the south. You know, that's kind of the way, that, the way it works, I guess. But they were all sort of related from uh, New York to Alabama. Weird little connection there. Weirder than we should go into right now. But um, she's uh, one of the more bubblier and charismatic members of the family. I first met Courtney at a police show in Birmingham, Alabama, which is where my family comes from. And uh, down in Birmingham, Alabama, the Copeland family takes up half a telephone book. So there was Courtney in this sea of Copeland faces um, uh, as a new member, her mother having just married my uncle. And um, after escaping from this clan thing, you know, American, Southern American families can be very crushing in their hospitality. But she took me off into the night uh, of Birmingham, Alabama. And she, I think, was 17 or 18 at the time. With her, she had a flash sports car. And she showed me all over Birmingham, the, the, the night lights of Birmingham, Alabama. And, um, and then I didn't see her again for a few years until she moved up to New York and um, was represented by my brother Ian as a model. And she got a gig in a, in a uh, Bruce Springsteen video, and the rest is history. Let's see, early remembrances of Courtney Cox. I was working at MTV, it's about 1983, 84, something like that, and we all heard about this. Um, gal who got into a Bruce Springsteen video and uh, Hershey's from Birmingham and I thought wow that's pretty cool another Birminghamian on MTV imagine that how often would that happen and uh, lo and behold she was in it and uh, I thought it was pretty groovy I then met her uh, I think shortly thereafter at a party at IRS records and uh, and we yapped about the hometown she's challenging that's what I like about her that's what my brother loved about her is that she's challenging. She's very quick. She doesn't take any BS. She cuts straight to the thing, and she's very challenging. After graduating, Cox headed for the Big Apple, where she hooked up with her Copeland cousins, joined the Ford Model Agency, and landed a part in a music video for the classic Bruce Springsteen track, Dancing in the Dark. When she was in the Bruce Springsteen video, she was supposed to be a fan plucked from obscurity which is really what she was at the time. She had had some work, um, I don't know if model is the right word, she was an actor in commercials, and I don't know if you call that a model, I'm not sure, thespian, I guess. Um, but that's, so that was her first, when a lot of people saw her, and, and uh, she started to get a lot of calls for a lot of different things. And she was in various things before friends came along. Um, but I guess that's where she really found her metier. 
Her modeling career continued to thrive, and she was cast in her first movie role in the 1987 film Masters of the Universe, and then as the girlfriend of Michael J. Fox in his TV show Family Ties. And Courtney was getting fan mail back then. Um, so a lot of times it's from girls, but I get strange ones. I get ones from people that claim they're the devil. I don't know, I get like really weird fan mail. But um, I don't know, usually it's from girls. More and more movie appearances followed. Courtney made nine films between 87 and 94, including a starring role alongside Jim Carrey in Ace Ventura Pet Detective, as well as television appearances on Seinfeld, The Larry Sanders Show, and Murder, She Wrote. I really don't know what her career wishes were when she was young, when I first met her in Birmingham, Alabama. But I could see that she had something which I've actually become familiar with, which is that golden ray of sun coming down from the heavens, lighting her up. In this sea of faces down there in Bummenheim, she stood out with her charisma and her sparkle and very quick wit. This was a live wire. You could see it back then. She had a particular sparkle. I can tell you that uh, Courtney is very puritanical. My wild and woolly brother Ian had all kinds of bad habits, drinking, partying, and late nights and all this stuff, and she slowed him right down. She just stopped that right there, and uh, he, uh, he absolutely had to clean up his act uh, with her. She didn't put up with any um, social deviance, you know, and she's actually just a good, clean girl from Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you very much. Come back and see us, y'all. I believe that Courtney's personal character is uh, not dissimilar to her character on, on Friends. She's a, she was a pretty no-nonsense gal, uh, from what I can tell in person. She's uh, kind of straight ahead. Sorry.